And I will sing forever of your love Come down with my hands to heaven Shout your praises loud And I was once the darkness when you pulled me out And I will sing forever of your love Come down And I will sing forever of your love Come down with my hands to heaven Shout your praises loud I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love come down I once was blind I could not see The chains of sin they had shackled me God in heaven, he heard my plea. Yes, Jesus, Jesus, rescue me. Yes, Jesus, Jesus, rescue me. And I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. Now grace so sweet, it was my soul. With my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. Well, there's a home. When you pull me out, I will sing forever of your love come down. I will sing forever of your love come down. With my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pull me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. I will sing forever of your love come down I will sing forever of your love Coming down, hallelujah We have come into His house
awesome. He is incredible. He is astounding. He is amazing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you serve a God that is amazing, a God that is astounding, a God that is awe-inspiring? We stand in awe of who He is and what He does. Amen? Has He ever done anything for you and it just makes you stand there with your draw, jaw dropped open and you just can't believe how awesome He is, how wonderful He is, the great and mighty things that He does. I just think sometimes about who He is and I just stand in awe of Him because He is an awe-inspiring, magnificent God. Amen? Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift up the name of Jesus today. Come on, lift him up and give him some praise. Hallelujah. 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 God is good. God is good. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before we let the kids go to class, we've got uh, something we want to show you. It's about our Operation Christmas Child. We've done this for the last couple of um of years but this year we're going to do it just a a little bit different so i think we're going to show a video and then angela's going to talk a little bit about it and then we're going to wrap that up but Rhonda, go ahead and play that first video god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son I want every child to know that there's a God. I want every child to know that God loves them, that God sent His Son from heaven to this earth to take our sins. We've got a charge to go into the world, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, here I am. Take me and send me and use me. God laid it on my heart. The Himbas need someone to give them the word of God. My vision for the Salma Khan tribe is that we will share the gospel and to establish a house church here so that they also can receive the, the, the blessing of Christ. Through the gift boxes, we are going places that no church will be allowed. Places like Gamvi, that floating village, we are reaching those that have never heard the gospel. We find them having not even a Bible in their own language. Areas of the world where people need to know that God loves them and cares them and sent His Son from heaven to this earth for them. God loves you and God loves me! Operation Christmas Child opened doors to evangelism, discipleship and multiplication. When a child receives a shoebox, it shows them who God really is and how much He cares for them. We bring gift to the children, also the mothers and the fathers and their brothers and sisters also accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. The churches are using these shoeboxes, the greatest journey discipleship program, to reach out to the ends of the earth with the gospel. God sent His Son to this earth on a rescue mission. Jesus Christ died and shed His blood on the cross for our sin. And then on the third day, God in heaven said, it's enough, and He raised His Son to life. This is the good news, and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth. I wrote everything down so I won't take but a second. I want to explain uh, what we're doing this year with Operation, Operation Christmas Child. The last few years, we've collected items throughout the year to fill the boxes. And then we would have a packing party, which is a great idea for certain um, times. But sometimes it has a drawback because we may not have the items that we need for certain ages. So this year, we're going to try a different way of filling the shoe boxes. Last year, we ended up filling about 30 to 35 boxes. So I had Amelia assemble 30 boxes already, and we have 20 more in the closet if we run out. 
So we want each family to or individual to take home a box or two or three today and you may want to fill a box for each child that you have. So if you have two children, you may want to have one for each one of your children um, or grandchildren or however you'd like to do it. And you can make it a service project at your home or you, know, you can go out shopping together and pick items out for your shoe box. You or your child will personally get to choose the, the age and gender that you would like to give Christmas to this year. Most items can be purchased at the dollar store and on a very small budget. We do recommend that you add a washcloth, bar of soap, toothbrush, and some type of socks or shoes like flip-flops or slides. Each box in the foyer that's set up out there, um, like this, has specific directions in it for a boy and a girl. You will fill your box and return it to the fellowship hall between November 1st and November 5th. I will then take the boxes to the drop-off center during Operation Drop-Off Week. If you would like, you can add $10 in the top of your box to cover shipping and processing. The most important thing we ask for you to do is to pray over your box as you fill it and pray over the child and the family that will receive it so that their hearts are open and prepared to accept Christ as their Savior. So please consider taking several boxes home with you today. Also, I have had some of you inquire about volunteering at the Processing Center in Boone. I tried really hard last year to get a group together, but it does fill up within seconds after the registration opens. So with that being said, I'm going to try again this year, but I want to encourage you to try too. Registration opens at 8 a.m. on February the 6th. So you can pre-register, uh, October 6th, thank you. So you can pre-register, yeah, don't be, February you would be late. Um, and be ready to select a date and time as soon as the clock strikes 8 on October 6th. Last year I was there waiting and the only thing left were spots for like one volunteer or two volunteers. So maybe at least you and a friend could go if I can't get us in as a whole church group. But I'm going to try. It's an incredible mission of spreading the gospel all across the world and giving Christmas to those who may not have Christmas without you. So, as you leave today, please consider having you and your family sponsor a shoebox and give Jesus and Christmas to a child in need. Thank you, Angela. Rhonda, play that other video if you don't mind. When you pack a shoebox full of gifts for Operation Christmas Child, your love is limitless. You never know where that shoebox will go or how it will get there or who will celebrate its arrival but God does. Your shoebox could dare a child to dream. It could heal a broken heart. It could change a child's life forever. Give a gift of limitless love. All right, that is a wonderful ministry that uh, Samaritan's Purse does, and we've uh, participated in the last couple of years. But again, this year's going to be a little different. So take your shoebox home with you. There's about 30 out there, 29 counting that one that's up here. And uh, fill it up, bring it back. If you got any questions, just let us know. And I know that the Lord will bless you because of your giving. We will let the uh, kids and uh, teachers, go ahead and go on to class. We've got classes for all ages today, as well as the nursery available. And if you, who are alive and remain, want to uh, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. I will go ahead and forewarn you that I've got a lot of notes, and I just don't know that I'm going to get through all of them today. So uh, we'll do what we can to get through. Amen? Amen. Is it uh, not working, Rhonda? Tina, you may want to give her a helping hand back there. Anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, and uh, I'll just turn there myself. And I have to get out my glasses. Right. All right. Second Corinthians chapter six. I just want to read one verse, verse number seventeen, and it says this. Huh? Here we go. 
There it is. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Let me read that again. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. I want to preach to you today on this topic. Get out. Turn to your neighbor and say, get out. Now, don't actually get up and leave. I mean, that's not what we're trying to instill here. So, hey, you, get out. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this day you've given us this wonderful opportunity we've got to be in your house. And, Lord, I pray that you would now bless your word, that you would speak into our hearts, that you would magnify your word today, Lord, that we would receive from you. We'd be changed because we've been in your presence and we heard from you. We give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you turn around and wave at four or five people. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord today. It is a good day to be in the house because if you're outside, you're going to get wet. Amen. So it's good to be in the house. So when we say that little phrase, get out, it can be, you know, kind of rude. It means to leave, I guess, right? But also it can mean like you don't believe something, right? Like I told you, see this flower arrangement here? I, I put all that together. You'd be like, get out, right? Because you know that I didn't do that, so it's not true. But if I did do that, then you, would, you wouldn't believe it. We'd be like, get out. But that's not the meaning that I wanted to get by, not even so much as you getting up and leaving, you know, more than just moving on or leaving. Uh, the, the phrase get out has more of a negative connotation to it, right? It implies almost a, a rudeness or a, a forcefulness of saying get out. And when you say it, it's like you say it in all caps with some exclamation points behind it, you know, or as I like to say, excited marks. You know, put the little excited marks behind it. And so that's kind of like what it, it feels like. But in the context that Paul is talking here in 2 Corinthians, let's back up a few verses. And this is what he says. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship does unrighteousness righteousness have with iniquity? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Or what agreement does Christ have with Baal? Or what portion does a believer have with an unbeliever? What agreement does a temple of God have with idols? For you are a temple of the living God, even as God says, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they may be my people. Therefore, he says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Get out. What he's saying here is he speaks especially to the issue of influence. And if we're not careful, we will be influenced. Maybe not in the way that we want to be influenced, but we'll be influenced. Paul's not suggesting that Christians should never associate with unbelievers. We should associate with unbelievers. We have to work with unbelievers, right? We have to live in the same neighborhood as unbelievers. Our kids are on the ball teams with, with unbelievers. Or, you know, they go to school with unbelievers. We, we associate with unbelievers. You know, you may even live in the house with an unbeliever. But the principle here is that we are supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. Just like a ship is supposed to be in the water, but the water is not supposed to be in the ship, right? We're supposed to be in it, but not have it inside of us. And more than just going into the ideals of God, we are to get out the ideals of the world. More than just accepting, yes, this is God's way and adding those to our lives, we are to renounce the ways of the world and the ways of Satan. We aren't just to get into what God's doing, we're to get out of what the world is doing. And I think it's important that we see some scriptures on this. So there are a few uh, examples that I want to give about folks who had this get out experience. And there's many examples in the Bible that we could use, but I want to start with this guy that we can hopefully use to apply this to our lives today. And we, like I said, I probably won't get through all four of these, but we'll get a good start on it today. The first guy I want to talk about is the guy by the name of Joshua. And of course, his story starts 
in the Old Testament, in uh, the, the books of, of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, you really see a lot about Joshua first introduced in the book of Exodus. But his story, so to speak, when he takes charge, begins in the book of Joshua. And Joshua is a type of Jesus. He is uh, what we would call a symbol or a type of Jesus, a picture of Jesus. And see, the Old Testament is really just a great big picture book. You know, when I read books, I like it when they have a lot of pictures in them, right? They're easier to read. It's like, this book don't have any pictures. I'm not sure I want to read this. But the Old Testament is a great big picture book because almost every New Testament principle has an Old Testament picture. Let me say that again. Almost every New Testament principle has an Old Testament picture. And we see that here in the book of Joshua. It is a picture of living the spirit-filled life. It is a picture of living the life that God wants you to live full of the spirit. You remember Jesus in John chapter 10 verse 10. He says that the thief has come not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy, but I've come that you may have life and that you have it more abundantly. He wants to give us an abundance abundant life. And if you've been born again, you have life. You've had your sins forgiven. You are saved. You've been delivered from death, hell, and the flames of fire that, that comes with that. You've been delivered from that punishment. You have life. But do you have life more abundantly? You say, well, I don't know exactly what that means. Well, I'm glad you asked. You always ask the best questions. See, it's God's desire for you to be more than just delivered from Egypt. It's his desire for you to be more than just saved from sin and delivered from Egypt. He wants to bring you into a land of promise. He wants to bring you into a land that is flowing with milk and honey. He wants to bring you into a land that has great provision. He wants to bring you to a place that is a land of abundance. We call it the promised land, right? Because it's land that was promised to the children of Israel long before they was able to go in and possess it. It was promised to them, so it's therefore called a promised land. But Jesus also has a promise for us that he wants us to step into. We have to get out of something so that we can get in to what he has for us. Many times people will think that the promised land is symbolic of heaven, Oh, I'm one day I'm going to cross into that Canaan. I'm going to cross into that promised land. Well, the promised land isn't a symbol of heaven because if you read through the book of Joshua, when they cross over the Jordan, there's still battles going on. There's still fighting going on. There's still wars that are being waged. There's still trouble in front of them. And even though we're saved and even though we go through things and even though, you know, we're, we've got God on our side, we can know that trouble still lies ahead. So the promised land isn't a sim symbol of heaven. It's a, it's a symbol of us moving to a different place, a different level of what God wants in our life. And Joshua experienced this. See, we see that there's still battles to be fought and wars to be waged. But know this, although the war wages, he still gives victory. Amen. We serve a God that's never been defeated. He is a unanimous champion. And so we can trust that he's always going to be in our lives. We may face walled fortresses in our lives, but know that we serve a God that can bring down those walls. We serve a God that can deliver us for, make deliverance for us. Although we may fight a long, hard battle, God can make the sun stand still just like he did for Joshua. He can do miraculous things in our life. We're not going to, we may be facing battles. We may be facing all kinds of struggles, but we're not facing them alone, but because we have God on our side. Aren't you glad that you got Jesus fighting for you? <laughs> Hallelujah. I recently was going through what I would call a small battle, right? We have things, some things that are major wars in our life, and then we have these little skirmishes, and we have these little battles. And it come up the, uh, a week or so ago that it just... 
It just felt like the devil was fighting. It just felt like that, you know, something kept rearing its ugly head. As a matter of fact, this is something that I had, I had prayed about. I had walked and anointed and prayed and said, all right, God, th this is done. This is through. And then things have been going good for a long time. And all of a sudden, this battle pops back up. And I didn't know how it was going to turn out. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know, even know how to respond. I didn't even know what needed to be done. And so I'm at a loss for words, and on my way to work one morning, I'm praying. And I'm thinking, God, you, you have to help me here, Lord. I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to begin to pray. Let's begin how to do something. And on my way to work, I look up, and I see in the sky this beautiful rainbow. And I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, because that tells me that his promises are true. Now, to some people, it might have just been a rainbow. For some people, it might have been, you know, well, the science behind it is that the light's shining through the clouds, and who cares about all that? What I'm telling you is that was God's sign to me that told me everything was going to be all right, that he loved me and that his promises are true and that he's going to come through for me. And sure enough, when I got to where I thought the battlefield was going to be, it turned out to be nothing. It was, it was more than nothing. It was a small victory for me, but even more importantly than that, I was able to tell other people, that was involved. I said, listen, I saw a rainbow on the way to work this morning. I don't know what that means to you, but to me, it means that God still loves me. It means that God's still in control. It means that God hasn't failed his promises. It means to me that God's still on the throne and that he's still fighting our battles. It can mean something to you, but I'm telling you, I saw a rainbow this morning and I'm telling you, God's on our side and he's going to give the victory. Hallelujah. I'm glad I serve a God that keeps his promises and a God that fights our battles for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul's writing here and he says that something like this, that he didn't want us to be ignorant. I love it when Paul tells us not to be ignorant because that really applies to me most days, right? He says, how that all of the fathers were under the same cloud and they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat and they all drunk the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. What's he doing? He's given us this Old Testament picture of this New Testament principle. He goes on in verse 11 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians and he says, now all these things happened unto them for in samples or examples for they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That Hebrew word for examples is the Hebrew word or, or I should say the Greek word typos. It's not like you make a typo. It's not like, you, you know, that kind of typo. It's a typos, which means it's where we get the word type. It is a picture. All of these things, he says, that happened to the Israelites, all these things that happened to them when they were in Egypt and they come out and they crossed the Red Sea and they were in the wilderness and they went into the promised land, all of that is an example, a type for us today. It's an Old Testament picture that paints a new type. Testament principle. Here is this principle in the New Testament that relates back to the Old Testament. And first of all, we see Egypt. That's a sign of us being in slavery. It's a sign of us being in bondage. And when they come out of Egypt, what was the thing that really made them de be delivered from Egypt? Is when all of the plagues happened. The tenth plague came and death was coming. And the only way to survive death was to take the lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and apply it on the doorpost. Amen. That's a perfect picture of what Jesus has done for us. He is the lamb that was slain, the lamb of God. God that shed his blood and when you take the blood of the lamb and you apply it upon the doorpost of your heart then you're delivered from sin you're delivered from bondage you're delivered from Egypt aren't you glad that you know Jesus in the full pardon of your sins they come out of Egypt and they go to the Red Sea. This is symbolic of them crossing across the Red Sea. It's symbolic of water baptizing. They go down 
into the water, they come out the other side. It's symbolic of life, death, and the resurrection. The old life is left behind. They've been baptized, and now they come out the other side. And it's like they're a new nation. They're a new people. They're a new creation because of the crossing of the Red Sea. But now they've been in the wilderness, and they wander around for 40 years. What is this place, this symbol for us? Well, it's a, it's a settling in for us. It, 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 it pictures for us uh, struggles and trials, but it also can picture for us dryness and getting in a rut and not, not being able to move forward. They were there for 40, what should have took them 40 days took them 40 years because they didn't listen, and that's a whole other story. But he provided for them, but it wasn't fruitful. He gave to them, but he, it wasn't plentiful. He, he met their needs, but they weren't in abundance and see, Paul encourages us that even though we're going through dryness, even though we're going through struggles, even though we're going through problems, he encourages us that though we're troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Because God is always on your side. And he says the reason that these trials come, Paul says, is to show that this all-surpassing power is from God. God and not from us. He is our source. So they've been delivered from Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. They've been saved. They've been baptized in water. Now they're living the saved life and they're in the wilderness. But then they come to Joshua and they come to this other body of water called the Jordan. And it represents to us a second baptism because there is a second parting just like God parted the Red Sea for Moses and them back 40 years earlier, now he's going to part the Jordan and they're going to go across on dry ground into the promised land. It is a second baptizing. It is the, to us, it symbolizes the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist, I call him JTB. That's really the first time I ever called him that, but... I'm going to stick with it now. So JTB says that I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's come to baptize you in the Holy Spirit, Jesus. As Jesus said in Luke 24 that he's going to give his disciples the promise. They are to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. See, they're going to go into the promise just like Joshua was crossing over and going into the the land that was promised, we cross over into the gift that is promised to us, and it is the Holy Spirit. It's not the crossing of a sea, but it is a crossing of a river. It's not a, a water parts, and you go down and you rise up to new life. This is a river that is flowing, and it stops, and you go through, and when you come out the other side, you get out into the promise, and Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and he that believes on me as the scripture had said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water the Bible says he spoke this of the Holy Ghost this is the Holy Spirit that comes and baptizes his believers and gives you that strength you need to get out and get into what God has for you hallelujah the Bible says in Joshua 1 chapter 2 Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even the children of Israel. See, part of going over is getting out. Part of going over into the abundant life is getting out of the rut. Part of going over into everything God has for you is getting out of the wilderness. Part of going over to the promise that God has given to you, the promise of the Holy Spirit, is you getting out of the funk that you're in, in the, 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 the desert, the dryness that you're in, moving to what God has for you, the full abundant life that he's got for you. Getting out of that dryness, getting out of that wilderness. I say this all the time that the Holy Spirit, 
does more than just excite you. He gives to you. He produces within you things you can't produce within your own self. He produces fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And if you're seeing in your life that you don't have love like you should or you don't have joy like you should or you don't have peace like you should or you don't have long suffering or gentleness, you're lacking in goodness, your faith just where it, where it shouldn't be, you're not really good with self-control, your meekness needs some adjustment, maybe you need more of the Holy Spirit in your life producing those things and making that fruit come forth. You can't do it within your own self. But with God, he can touch you and fill you. His will is for you to experience power and presence in your life. His will is for you to step in to the expectancy and the anticipation of what he's going to do and to step out in power and authority and anointing and step out into your calling of what God's got for your life. You got to get out. To be able to get all God has for you. And that brings me then to the next point and the next person, the next prophet. His name is Jonah. Man, we all know about Jonah, don't we? I mean, Jonah's one of those stories that's just told all through your childhood growing up, right? Everybody knows about Jonah, I would think, just like Lion. Daniel in the lion's den, or David and Goliath, Jonah and the whale, right? So I'm not going to try to rehash the whole story, but I think to summarize it, Jonah was called of God to go to Nineveh. And he ran the opposite direction. And he didn't want to go. He refused to go. So he goes down and he boards a ship, a place called Joppa. He boards a ship to go into Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction, like five times further away than where he should have been going. Well, a storm comes up because Jonah's running from the Lord and the people on board don't know what to do. So they finally they realize that it's Jonah and Jonah's the problem. They say, what should we do? And Jonah says, you're going to have to throw me overboard. And I was like, oh, we don't know about that. We really don't want to do that. But as the storm kept raging, they finally decided, all right, Jonah, get out. Get out. It's time for you to get out. And they grab him by the seat of the pants and throw him overboard, Right? So let's just go ahead and before we got, dive too much deeper into that and address the elephant in the room, or should I say the whale that's in the room, right? I've heard recently that people say, well, that story is a fable because it's impossible. It's impossible for a whale, or as the Bible calls it, a great fish. I don't know that it was a whale. It was a great fish. Maybe it was just a fish that God created just for that one time to swallow Jonah. He could do that. But scientists will say, well, that's impossible. Man can't go down into the belly of a whale. He couldn't survive the, the trip down the esophagus, down into the stomach. He couldn't, and even if he did get down in there, he wouldn't have any oxygen. The enzymes of the stomach would eat him away and so forth and so on. He wouldn't survive. Reminds me of a story I heard of a little boy that had boarded a plane. He was on there on by himself, and he was flying to meet his grandparents, and and uh, he actually had to sit down beside a person who claimed to be an atheist. So they begin to talk, and the conversation goes, uh, you know, you believe this, and you believe the Bible, and the little boy's doing his best to defend himself, and the atheist is just really starting to hound on him pretty good. And he said, well, what about the story of Jonah? That couldn't be possible. It's impossible. A man can't be swallowed up by a whale. And the little boy's like, well, I don't know. You know, it's just what the Bible says. I just believe it. And the atheist says, well... I just don't think it's scientifically possible. And he goes through all these scenarios and all these problems and all the things. And the boy says, well, I don't know. I just, I don't have the answer to all that. But when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah myself. And atheist said, oh, yeah, well, what if he didn't go to heaven? And the little boy said, well, you can ask him. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. But science will tell you that it's impossible. But you know what? I believe science but I also believe God, right? See, because God takes over where science stops. Miracles begin where knowledge ends, right? 
That's where, you know, where the natural ends. That's where the supernatural take, uh, takes over. Where the possible stops, that's where the impossible begins. Where the probable ends, that's where the improbable begins. Where the ordinary ceases, that's where the extraordinary begins. Science will say H2O will always be H2O. You can't change water to anything but water. H2O is always H2O. And yeah, I believe that. I believe science. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with science. I believe it. But I also believe that H2O can become wine when Jesus speaks and tells it to become wine. When Jesus changes it, science will tell you that it's impossible for a man to walk on water. And I believe that it's probably impossible until God bids him to step out of the boat and to start walking on the water. Amen. The Bible will, will tell you, I mean, the science will tell you there is no cure for leprosy. You can't cure leprosy. Even today, there's no cure for leprosy. I believe that too. However, I also believe that when Jesus says, be thou cleansed, that leprosy dries up, blind eyes can't see. I believe that. Deaf ears can't hear. I believe that. The lame can't walk. I believe that. But I also believe that until they get touched by Jesus and Jesus says, eyes be opened and ears be opened and those that are lame begin to walk, God can touch them. Science will tell you that a man that's been dead for four days surely still and he probably does until Jesus says Lazarus come forth and he that was dead comes forth hallelujah I believe in miracles I believe God still works miracles if you believe that give him some praise hallelujah with man it is impossible but with God all things are possible if you don't believe it just look at little Eleanor she's supposed to have been in the hospital for weeks upon weeks Two weeks after surgery, she's out. Now, she's still got a long ways to go, but she's out. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of God. The Old Testament, people would disobey, and God would send them a prophet. And the prophet would say, you need to obey. And that's kind of the way the Old Testament went. People would disobey, and God would send them a prophet. And the prophet would say, you need to obey. Well, who do you send when the prophet is the one that's disobeying? You send a wave, you send a wind, you send a storm. That's what you send. Jonah is running from God, and running from God will always cost you. It'll always cost you. The Bible says that he goes down and he pays his own fare to leave to go to Tarsus. He's supposed to go to Nineveh, which is this direction, about 500 miles. But he pays his own money to go to Tarsus, which is in that direction, about 2,500 miles. It's about five times further away than where he was supposed to go in the opposite direction. And see, that's just like what happens when you run from God. It'll cost you more than you're willing to pay. And it'll take you further than you're willing to go because you're disobedient and you're running from God. Let me tell you, God will tell you and he'll tell you and he'll tell you and you need to listen. You need to obey. Everything in this story, I love it, everything in the story obeys God but Jonah. The winds obey God. The waves obey God. The storm obeys God. The whale obeys God. Even the people on the ship obey, and they throw Jonah overboard. But Jonah is the only one who doesn't obey. He's running from the call that's in his life. And you have a call in your life as well. May not be a preacher. May not be a pulpit ministry. May not be a pastor. May not be an evangelist. But you have a call in your life. Your call is to be a witness. Your call is to go and make disciples. Your call is to experience Jesus. Then go out and tell others what you've experienced and tell them about Jesus too. You have to be willing to step up when that call rings. Amen? I had a guy that's been on my heart for the last, I don't know, month or so. It's a guy I grew up with and he, I know that he lives over in the same neck of the woods that I live in now, and I very rarely see him. I seen him a couple of years ago at, at Walmart, and 
and I invited him to church and some other people that I knew had talked to him and I was like, man, they invited him to church. You see him? Tell him I'm asking about him. And I go by his, in the general direction of his house on my way to church and when I go to some other places and I stop at a stop sign and I turn left and if you turn right, just almost out of view, I can see his house. I can like see the edge of his yard and I think about him all the time and yesterday I was doing some stuff on my truck I was working on my truck and I broke something you know that's what happens when I'm doing the work I don't know what I'm doing so there's a the thing where your windshield wiper you know where the, the course the fluid out on your windshield I broke that little piece and so I had to go buy one and so I go to Advance Auto in Abingdon and I walk in and guess who I see the guy that I'd been thinking about. And so what did I do? I went up to him and started talking to him and just, hey, man, it's good to see you. And I said, listen, we want to see you. I want to see you come to church. He knows where it's at. I told him Sundays at 11, come and be with us. He said, man, I need to. I said, yeah, you need to. God's been good to you. You need to come and, and, and get in back to the fellowship. And see, when those opportunities come, you need to take advantage of them because God has called you to be a witness and to go and make disciples. And any times there's disobedience in your life, there's going to be a storm brewing. Any time you're running from God, there's going to be a storm brewing. Lots of people will say, why is this storm going on in my life? Why are you running from God? Why is this happening in my life? Are you running from God? Why is all this going on? Is there disobedience in your life? And people wonder why they don't have joy and why they don't have peace and why they don't have love and why they struggle. Are you running from God? Are you listening? Is there disobedience in your life? And the problem is that sometimes when, when troubles come, we want to get rid of the things we need to be hanging on to. We get rid of the wrong things. That's what happened in this story. They begin to throw all their cargo out. And I'm not sure what kind of cargo they had, but they were obviously going to Tarsus for a reason hauling some kind of cargo there, they begin to throw all of their stuff overboard and it didn't solve the problem. And that's what happens to us lots of times. We try to solve our own problems by doing things that don't make sense and we end up getting rid of the things that we need to keep. I've known people, and you have too, that when troubles come, they stop coming to church. They stop reading their Bible. They stop fellowshipping with others that could help them. Why do they do that? They're getting rid of the things they need, and they won't get rid of the things that they need to get rid of. I'm talking about getting things out. Get them out of your life. After these people on the boat discovered that Jonah was the problem, they still tried to keep him. The Bible says they was rowing as hard as they could to try to get to shore, and finally they just gave up. Sometimes you have to just give up and get rid of the thing that's causing the problem. And until you obey, the storm will continue to rage and there'll be no peace. We allow things in our lives that don't belong there. We all do. Things in our lives that are disobedient. Things in our lives that we know we need to get out, we allow it there. Whether it's through our entertainment or whether it's through our music or whether it's through our habits. Maybe it's things like bitterness or, or unforgiveness or maybe it's some kind of hurt. Or maybe we allow things in our lives that we shouldn't allow there. And maybe it's gossip and maybe it's this problem or that problem. We all do it. We allow it in our lives. It's time to get it out. Maybe it's even relationships. You need to get out of your life and throw Jonah overboard. Get him out of your boat. The Bible says that if we will obey God, right? All we got to do is obey God. Why don't we just obey God? See, these people probably shouldn't have let Jonah on the boat in the first place. Probably shouldn't even let him on. They didn't know who he was or what kind of trouble he was in, but they're like, yeah, come on. How many people, how many things do we allow in our lives that we know there's not from God? We know God didn't send that. We know that's not from God, and yet we still allow it to come into our lives. Not letting Jonah in your boat to start with. An ounce of provision is better than a pound of cure, right? So if you can just prevent it to start with, 
But we allow people and we allow things into our lives that we fully know God's not involved with. Today, I'm telling you to throw Jonah overboard. Get it out. Get him out. Get those old hurts out. Get those old habits out. Get those wrong relationships out. Get that bitterness out. Get that wrong attitude out. Get that negative attitude out. Get it out of your life. Get that bitterness out. Get that hurt out. Kick it out, get it out of your life. Unless you do, you'll never be where God wants you to be. You'll be running from the Lord. See, we we think disobedience is is going out and doing wild things, you know, going out and partying and going out and doing evil things. That's disobedience can be that, but it also can be you not doing what God wants you to do. You can sit on a pew and still be running from God. Amen. And people do that all the time, and we need to get that out of our life. So that we can get to where God wants us to be. And he wants us to be a temple of God. He wants us to be a place where he can dwell. He wants us to be his dwelling place. And until we get our hearts right. Until we get that place cleaned out. Sometimes you have to clean house. And sometimes you got to throw some things out. That need to be thrown out. Amen. And get rid of it. He wants us to be a holy place. A holy temple that's pure, that's holy, that's sanctified for him, that's tried, that's true, that's something that God can use. He wants us to clean it out and to get it out. Amen?